Well, good morning. It's good to see you all here today. I'm so glad that we are gathered today to worship. I am Pastor Andrea Paulson. If you're visiting us today, we are glad that you are here. Um, I'm associate pastor here at First St. Paul's. For everybody else here today, it's good to see you. I missed you last week, but I was on a beach, so not that much. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> But I do thank you for St. Paul's for allowing my husband and I to go and take that Sabbath break. And so, um, but it is so good to be back. We have a couple announcements as we begin this morning. First of all, we will be receiving new members at the 1035 service this morning. And so I would invite all First St. Paul's members, current members, to be praying for our new members, to be looking for faces you don't recognize, and to be extending welcome and um, inviting our new families to be active and vibrant members of our congregation. A couple other announcements. On June 4th, we will be recognizing college graduates uh, at the 1035 service. And so if you are the parent of a college graduate or you are a college graduate this year or master's graduate or PhD, whatever, um, we want to recognize your hard work and your dedication. And so that will be at the 1035 service. Royal, Royal Families Kids Camp, I, bleh, Royal Family Kids Camp <laughs> is this week. Uh, starting on Tuesday, and we would invite you to, wait, what day is it today? Yes, tomorrow. It's starting on Monday. <laughs> and uh, we invite you to be praying for this ministry as we minister to the less fortunate kids in our area. And the theme verse for Royal Family Kids Camp is Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, which is to trust in the Lord with all your heart and to lean not on your own understanding. And as young people come to this camp this week, May this be our prayer for all of these children that are served, that they would learn to trust in the Lord, but also a reminder for ourselves as well. Last but not least, nope, two, two more things, sorry. Um, VBS is next week, and we are in need of more volunteers. And so if you can give of your time next week in any way, shape, or form, please call in and find out how you can serve. There's a room, uh, there's space for every gift, every talent um, during VBS. We also have some packets, some craft packets at the VBS station. So if you're you know, at a game this week, watching your child play or, or watching TV or something, grab one of those craft packets and just help us get everything ready for VBS. There will be a volunteer training for VBS this Tuesday night and Thursday night. So if you have already given us your name that you are interested in volunteering, please plan our, on Tuesday or Thursday night for our meeting. There will be no Alpha tonight for those of you who've been coming to that. And finally, it is Memorial Day weekend. And so on Memorial Day weekend, we honor those who gave their lives um, serving our country. And so if you are the family of a military member who, who gave the ultimate sacrifice, we are praying for you. And if you have served in our military at any time or are current serving, just know that we are so thankful for the gift of service and the sacrifice that means for your family. So those are our announcements today. At this time, I invite you to stand. The peace of Christ be with you always. I invite you to move around and welcome others to worship today. And now we join together as a united body of Christ for confession and forgiveness. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. God of all mercy and consolation, 
Come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. And now let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your spirit so that we may live and serve you through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all of our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I declare to you the entire forgiveness of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you to join us in singing our opening hymn this morning, number 657, Rise, O Son of Righteousness. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Amen. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, 
Comfort and defend us, gracious Lord. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. Let us pray. Almighty God, your only Son was taken into the heavens and in your presence intercedes for us. Receive us and our prayers for all the world, and in the end bring everything into your glory. Through Jesus Christ, our sovereign and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. The first reading is from Acts, the first chapter, verses 6 through 14. These may be found on pages 884 and 885 in the Bibles located in the pews. When the apostles had come together, they asked Jesus, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or the periods that the Father has set by his own authority but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot and Judas, son of James. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer, together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. Here ends the first reading. The second reading is from the fifth chapter of 1 Peter, verses 6 through 11. And this may be found on page 986 in the Bibles located in the pews. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Discipline yourselves, keep alert. Like a roaring lion, your adversary, the devil, prowls around looking for someone to devour. Resist him, steadfast in your faith, for you know that your brothers and sisters in all the world are undergoing the same kinds of suffering. And after you have suffered for a little while, The God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, support, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Here ends the reading. Please stand for the gospel.
Our gospel passage today is from John chapter 17, and this can be found on page 879 of the Bibles you have before you. The Holy Gospel according to John, the 17th chapter. After Jesus had spoken these words, he looked up to heaven and he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so that the son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all, all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours and you gave them to me and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave me, I have given to them. And they have received them. And they know in truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours and yours are mine and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me so that they be, may be one as we are one. The Gospel of our Lord. Our hymn is number 759, My Faith Looks Up to Thee. I invite you to be seated. 
And also open up your Bibles to that First Peter chapter because that's we're going to be talking about that this morning. First Peter, you know, as I was thinking about this First Peter chapter passage this morning, I started thinking about how our culture has many perceptions of Satan or the enemy or the devil. Turn to your neighbor and tell them one cultural perception of who the devil is. What does the devil look like? How are they dressed? What do they carry? When I think about cultural perceptions of Satan, the thing that immediately pops into my mind is the church lady, Dana Carvey. Could it be Satan? How many of you remember watching Dana Carvey as the church lady on Saturday Night Live? But yet we have this passage of scripture today in verse 8 that says, Discipline yourselves and keep alert. Like a roaring lion, your adversary, the devil, prowls around looking for someone to devour. Lord God, we thank you this morning for your word that reminds us of your truth. And as we talk about the cultural perception of the enemy and how he works, we pray, Lord, that you would open our eyes and that you would remind us to be alert and to be disciplined and to resist. It's in your name we pray. Amen. C.S. Lewis, in his, uh, in his writing, God in the Dock, writes this, or wrote this, no reference to the devil is included in any Christian creeds. And it is quite possible to be a Christian without believing in them. So as you think about the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed that we say, no reference to the devil is included. And I have to say that I agree with what C.S. Lewis was observing at the time that he wrote. I agree that it is possible to be a confessional Christian, a confessional Lutheran, and still not believe in the devil. Or, if we do believe that there is Satan or devil, it's kind of an out there belief. We don't really talk about it because if we start talking about the devil or Satan, then we are the fundamentalist church lady and people will probably wonder when we're bringing out the snakes and the tongues. But the truth of the matter is that if it is in God's word, then we cannot simply talk about evil in the world. We have to talk about what God's word tells us about where evil comes from. And if it is in God's word, then we must equip ourselves with knowledge about who God says he is, but who he also says the enemy is, so that we can stand firm and resist. So who is the adversary, this roaring lion? The term devil, when we think of that, we think red pitchfork and horns. But the term devil is actually a Greek translation of a Hebrew word, Satan. And what's interesting as I was studying for this is that the Hebrew word Satan, I didn't have to take Hebrew, I think I got it easy there, I just had to do Greek. Um, <laughs> The word Satan in Hebrew is written as a word picture, and each character of the Hebrew word Satan tells us about who Satan is and how he acts and functions. The word Hebrew, from Hebrew means to act as an adversary. But there are many more names and descriptions. Devil itself, from the root word to accuse, is used 36 times in the New Testament, 36 times. But it doesn't stop there because the Bible tells us much more about who our enemy is by drawing us a word picture. And he draws us a word picture by using words like serpent, an enemy, a dragon, a destroyer, a fallen star, the prince of demons, the ruler of darkness, the tempter, the thief, and the evil one. And every some, single one of those words gives us a picture of how the devil, or Satan, our enemy, operates. 
But it's not just random people who wrote scripture. It's not just Paul and Peter and John who use these words. Jesus himself called the enemy a murderer from the beginning. A thief who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. The father of all lies, the evil one, and the king of this world. And then we have Peter today who tells us that like a roaring lion, your adversary, the devil, prowls around looking for someone to devour. My friends, you and I know that there's evil in the world, but we have to be reminded today that there is an adversary, a roaring lion, but Jesus roars louder. We'll get back to that. So, so what is the purpose of the enemy? What is his mission statement, if you would? The adversary is like a roaring lion prowling, looking for someone to ensnare and to devour so that they are destroyed. So how does the enemy devour people? Two ways. He does it by thwarting the will of God and by destroying, utterly destroying those who are committed to God's will. And let's be perfectly clear that this is not just individual, this is also collective. Countless individuals have been ensnared and devoured and destroyed by the enemy over the years, but let me tell you something, so have ministries and churches. Ministries and churches have been destroyed by the enemy, and let me tell you today, pray for your pastors, not just me and not just Joel, but every pastor, because they are in the line of fire Destroying those committed to God. And why? What is the purpose of ensnaring and destroying and devouring? Because if people turn away from God, if you turn away from God, you cannot shine his light. If I turn away from God, I cannot speak his truth. If ministries and churches in sin turn from God's will and start seeking their own, they cannot do his kingdom work. This is no joke. It is one thing to believe in evil. We saw evil twice this week in Manchester and Egypt. It is one thing to believe in evil. It is something entirely different to know that we have an enemy who prowls and to realize that he is seeking destruction of God's people. And Jesus echoes this, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Jesus knew what he was talking about because it happened to him in the desert before he started his ministry. So we have an adversary, a roaring lion, but Jesus roars louder. We'll come back to that. So we know what the enemy's mission statement is, but now how does it happen? There's three ways from what I can tell. First of all, the enemy will distort the meaning and application of scripture. Look at the Bibles you have in front of you. Distort the meaning by preventing people from hearing the message of truth and grace. There are thousands of communities in our world that are utterly unchurched because the gospel has no way to get in. And like we saw in Egypt on Sunday, even where it is shining, Christians are under attack. And so the enemy does this by preventing people from hearing the message of truth and grace. If you can't hear it, you don't know it. But next up, also in that same vein, is that he undermines the work of churches by taking little tidbits of scripture and using them as shrapnel-sized, deeply wounded, wounding uses. On our way to our trip, Jeff and I stopped at Westboro Baptist because we were curious. We didn't post a picture of Westboro Baptist because you can't post it, it's hateful. But you don't think that there haven't been people in our country and our world who have been pierced by their words and their misuse of scripture. You don't think that that's the use of the work of the enemy. It is. 
But also on that note, you and I cannot become apathetic. Do not think for a second that yours and mine and the collective Christian church's utter biblical illiteracy isn't the work of the enemy. We are a biblically illiterate church, not just us, us in general, big church. If you can't say to somebody what you believe, they will tell you what they think you do. Always have an answer for everything, for every hope you have. If we do not pick up his word and soak into it, we cannot understand and we cannot share and we cannot bind wounds that have been left by shrapnel and replace them with grace. So the twisting of God's word is one way. Second, deception. The thing is that the enemy wants to convince you and I that our situation is the worst that it could ever be. The greatest and most deceptive, seductive lie of the roaring lion is that you have it worse than anybody else and that you have been singled out for special suffering. He wants us to believe that our stuff is definitely worse than everybody else's and that we are alone. That while we suffer, everybody else is thriving. While our stuff is hard, everyone else is enjoying a picnic in the barbecue. It's fantastic. And don't for a minute think, for those of you teenagers, adults who are on social media, don't for a minute think that Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, whatever it is, has not been used by the enemy to make you feel like you've been singled out. That's why Peter tells us in scripture that others are suffering. Your brothers and sisters are undergoing the same things, but the enemy wants us to believe that we're alone and that God has singled you out for pain and suffering. What a deception. And the last part that all kind of comes together, the, 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 the twisting of scripture and the lie that you're going it alone is that he masquerades as light. Part of Satan's shrewd subtlety is his ability to masquerade as truth. And so he is able to deceive us into believing that we've been chosen to suffer, and as we buy that decision, we do the one thing that will utterly destroy us. We question that God is good. And so what he does is he tempts us the the same way he did in the garden. Did God really say... Did did God really say not to do that? Did God really say not to cheat on your spouse? Did God really say not to turn to alcohol? Did God really say not to cut? Did God really say? We trade the truth of a God for a lie because we doubt God's goodness because we have bought the deception and we have turned from his word. And see, what happens is when we draw away from God, we wallow more in our suffering, we buy more deception, and we start doing things that we hope will make the pain and misery go away, but in the end, it kills, and it steals, and it destroys. Do you see it? Like a roaring lion, our adversary, the devil, prowls around looking for someone to devour. And let me tell you, if you can't tell, when I was studying this, I have seen how this has happened in my own life. Distortion and application of God's word. Check, yes, okay, that, yep, been there. Deception that my suffering is worse than everybody else's. Check, check. Questioning God's goodness. Triple check. It is the enemy's playbook. It is better any, than any Super Bowl winning team to kill your faith and to steal your joy and in doing so destroy your life. There is an adversary, a roaring lion, but Jesus roars louder. So what about this louder roar? We know from scripture that there is a roaring lion, but let me tell you that there is Jesus, the lion of Judah, who roars louder. In the gospel passage today from John 17, Jesus is about to go to the cross. And he is praying to God the Father for the disciples and the believers. And he prays that God would protect us 
and them from the evil one, and that we would be sanctified by the truth. And the truth is, the truth is this morning, that Satan may have power and may seem to have strength, but Jesus Christ through God has ultimate and complete power, and even more than that, victory. Victory. When we look at the cross, we see the victory of Christ. The empty grave reminds us that while it may seem that the enemy is on the game, he is already defeated. The game is over. And there is more. We know that when we have faith in Christ, that even when we stumble, his death took the punishment for sin. And the verdict for you and I when we are deceived and when we turn from God is that the verdict is not guilty and we can never be separated from the love of Christ. It is grace upon grace upon grace. And I don't know about you, but I hear the Lion of Judah roar. Roar louder. And so for Monday, as we take this message and we think about this and marinate in God's grace and truth, we move forward with a few things that Peter gives us as advice. First, keep alert. Recognize that there is an enemy on the prowl. Keep alert by reflecting on where you slip and where you struggle or where you stumble. And then resist. Be aware of the playbook and lies and deception Resist the temptation to question the goodness of God or to believe that you've been singled out. And then discipline yourself. Discipline yourself to dig into God's word. Maybe you've been reading the Bible daily your whole life. Maybe you've never picked it up outside of church. Dig into God's word. Bathe in truth and grace because we are In God's word, we are reminded of his purpose, we are reminded of his truth, and the Holy Spirit gives us the power to say boldly, step off, Satan, you've got nothing on me. And then we are transformed. We keep alert and we resist and we discipline ourselves, and as we do so, we're reminded that there is an adversary, there is a roaring lion, but Jesus, the Lion of Judah, the Savior and Messiah, is from everlasting to everlasting louder. And in his loud roar, he restores and he supports and he strengthens and he establishes us. And to him be the power and all the glory forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to stand and sing with me number 742, What a Friend We Have in Jesus.
Please join me in our confession of faith through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated for the offering. Rejoicing in the risen life of Christ, let us pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. I will end each petition with, Lord, in your mercy. Please respond. Hear our prayer. We pray for the church. Clothe us with your power. Uphold all preachers and teachers of the gospel. Unite us through the Spirit and lead us out in mission. Lord, in your mercy. For the earth, for hills and valleys, prairies and pastures, for deserts and mountains, tundras and bogs, 
nurture all plants and animals, and sustain those whose labor produces our food. Lord, in your mercy. For the nations, guide all local, national, and international leaders. Build up safe communities. Bring an end to violence in families, as well as between nations. Liberate those who live under oppression. Strengthen those who work for equality. Lord, in your mercy. For those in need, for those who travel, for those who are abused or neglected, for all refugees and immigrants, for students approaching a graduation, for those who are ill, especially Eileen Olson and Diane Vordestras. Lord, in your mercy. For this assembly, bless those who are preparing for baptism, especially Vivian Morgan Savage, who is being baptized today. Strengthen our ministries of education and outreach. Uphold those who lead us in prayer and song. Lord, in your mercy. Pour out your blessing on all those celebrating graduations, marriages, and other transitions during this season, especially Randall and Angela Shipman, celebrating 25 years of marriage. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, may we show your joy by embracing those who join our congregation today. Natalie Burr, Judy Hill, Andrew Hollister, Jacqueline Hotelling, Norma McWhorter, Helen Miller, Andrew Nelson, Ben and Armicia, Beckman and Bryson Onkin, and Tessa Menke, Kayla Starman, John and Kim Story, Evan and Krista Volsky. Keep us close together in your spirit as we share in the work you have prepared for us in this place. Lord, in your mercy. With thanksgiving, we remember those who have died. <clears throat> Inspire us by their witness and bring us to receive our inheritance with all the saints in your glory. Lord, in your mercy. Joining our voices with your faithful ones in every time and place, we offer our prayers in the name of the risen one, Jesus Christ our Lord, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. May God, who has brought us from death to life, fill you with great joy. Almighty God, Father and Son and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. The congregation, please be seated. Good morning. Just a couple announcements really quick. Andrea already kind of covered um, the VBS volunteers, so I'm going to kind of just extend an extra request that if you think of it during the week, just be praying for that. Um, we have a lot of kids coming. We actually hung door knockers on houses throughout the entire neighborhood, so um, as much as we're excited to have all these little kids, we also need volunteers to accommodate those needs. So if you could be praying um, for that cause, that would be awesome. The other thing is summer Sunday school. If you have kids, if you have grandkids who you know um, are not quite sure whether they're coming to Sunday school this summer or not, have them come. It's just going to be me. Um, I think we're going to play kickball today, and families are welcome to come too. So just wanted to extend that invitation and um, have them invite their friends as well. So with that, I will hand this back. Thank you. Um, congregation, please stand, and our closing hymn is hymn number 662.
peace and serve our Lord.